Greetings and salutations, everyone, and welcome back to the second half. I hope everyone is still doing well on this Sunday evening. Before we get into this very interesting and informative interview, a couple links. As you all know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support this channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost you a cent. Click that like button. Takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because these things really do help this channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, they really do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to tonight's second half. Shall we? All right, everybody. Tonight I have Steph back with us, and he is going to share some experiences with us tonight, or inexperience, a experience with us tonight. Uh, so, those of you who were upset with just the um, information. Now you guys can get excited for the experiences. Steph, how are you? Um, I'm doing a lot better. I uh, got my blood work and my imaging back this Monday, and there's no new tumor growth, and my biomarkers are within 2% of normal. So looks like I got out of the woods, do some extra imaging over the next year to make sure nothing comes back. And after five years, I'm technically in remission. But after 90 days of no cancer, I can finally get my new artificial hip. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Ironically oh, enough, yeah. my dad's going through a similar thing. He had to uh he had some surgery last year and oh. he needs a new shoulder, but they had to wait until uh the infection in his leg where the stint was cleared up. Oh yeah. So in August he'll be getting his new shoulder. So good stuff on both ends uh, for you guys. So um yeah, it's been a couple weeks since we talked uh, on the channel now I don't know what you want to talk about because it's kind of a surprise to me as well like I said in the beginning uh, of this you want to be surprised yeah I <laughs> so you can react to surprise it. So, so I can react um, so I'm gonna turn the floor over to you and uh, I may periodically interrupt you which people love oh, yeah. I guess um, no, I'm just <laughs> kidding but uh so Floor is yours, my friend. <laughs> All right. Before I start, I'd just like to thank everybody who left such nice comments and anybody who offered their prayers towards me. Even though I'm not a religious person, I do appreciate the faith, and I hope they were part of the help. And I noticed a couple of you out there are having sicknesses or recovering, and I hope the best goes for you guys, too. So hang in there. And one quick thing I learned in this chemo session was that there's a process called cold capping, where they actually – I used a – clinic that did it but they if you could they uh keep your head and scalp uh with dry ice fog for about six hours after chemo and it prevents the exothermic reaction from killing your hair follicles and you get to keep your hair so i'm very happy that seems superficial but that made a big difference in how i felt about myself during that time period so just letting other people out there know that's something that's available and uh, i guess i'll get started here um I'm going to talk about whip dogs. This is the first time I actually ran across a photophore in the eye. And we were out in uh, North Africa, and we had originally been working on a bauxite deposit with hitchhiker ores, you know, the rare ores. And we had uh, found bags and biffs, which are banded, banded iron formations, and biologically accreted gold. And in that area, uh, a lot of people don't realize that 80% of the world's iron supply comes from 
old microorganisms that used to use iron atoms as a uh, molecular switch for their ATP, ADP mitochondrial reactions. And there was a lot of uh, algae in old seas in that area that used gold as an electron switch in their ATP, ADP. So it's a biologically accreted gold planes. So there, if you can find a layer of that, you can find a huge amount of gold uh, from South Africa all the way up into the center of Africa and even further. So enough geology. We were on a plateau and we were operating up there and we had a nice series of connexes, which are the big freight containers. We had, those are usually organized into a semi-fortified situation. And so that's just a general overview of what you're doing. So it was somewhere in the second or third week. Um, one of the there was a large amount of noise and a bit of gunfire from the south side and a lot of us went over there were no insurgents in the area at that time so we were a little bit surprised and none of the lookouts had said anything because we have indigenous hunters and lookouts out there that help keep the animals back and give us a heads up if uh, militants were coming in and so a lot of us ran over there and uh, by the time we got there there was something on the ground big not like super big but like about the uh, Caniform, as I've said, it's about four foot at the shoulder, and it's probably about five feet long, not counting the tail, and it was just thrashing on the ground, and one of the guys was dragging one of the indigenous away from it, and that guy was bleeding pretty bad, and a couple other guys had got there before me, and they finished it off. And but man, that thing was thrashing. It had taken a lot of rounds, and a lot of animals slump or run or do something. But man, it looked like a seizure. I don't know if you've ever seen an animal in extreme pain. But are extremely aggressive. You know what I'm talking about? I do. I had a dog that had epilepsy, and he used to have seizures all the time. Okay, it kind of looked like a seizure. But, I mean, this thing was obviously shot to hell and dead. And, but, I mean, it went down hard. But, I mean, not any harder than, like, an oversized melanistic hyena or something. But it went down hard. And a couple other guys started pointing out there and taking a couple shots. And... I can see at least four or five of these things moving around the perimeter. And what's really weird is they have a hunched back that's pretty big, and they're walking and moving like dogs and running back and forth, but their tail is really long, and it kind of you can almost see the sacral vertebra sort of aspects through it. So it have really strong tails, but you could actually see the ridging of the tailbone, and not at that moment, but you know, just later study. And there's a lot of them out there. And other people started yelling up that they're all around the place. And so um, we we're all actually falling back to the interior of the connexes where they're surrounding us. And the connexes are surrounded by HESCOs, which are those giant wire baskets you fill with rocks. Are you familiar with those? Yes. Yeah. And so to anybody in the armed service out there listening, there's nothing worse than filling HESCO. So I'm with you on that. That sucks when we were setting that up. <laughs> but... <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, we got limited ingress and egress, and we got some, we're sufficient with guns, so I'm not too worried, but there's a lot of them, and it's about an hour before dusk, and, you know, we're on the edge of the Sahara, so we get a long light, and the weather's stable, but, yeah, we, I don't know what these things are, I mean, they look like hyenas missing uh, fur, except they're, you know, back, I, I guess they look more like uh, Greyhound, or Whippet, but, like, super big. Okay. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, kind of that structure, except they're like, you know, they kind of have that hunched shoulder and the head's down a little bit, sticking forward. Yep. And their tail is weird because <clears> the tail's <throat> angled down. Not like straight down, but, you know, kind of angles down. And the tail is about another two feet off the body, but those tails are strong. They're like Rhodesian Ridgebacks. They'd be running, and then they could change direction like 90 degrees going really fast. No, so we had no idea what we were dealing with. So we were shooting them out, and they wouldn't go away. And there was a lot. I have no idea how many were out there. So we had already called back into base, and we were told them what we were dealing with. And we was like asking them what's out here and what these things are, because none of us know what they are. And they said an EH team would be out, which is environmental hazards team. And those are G1 or Gamma 1, and uh, we're Gamma 2. So Gamma 1s get a lot more money, and they're usually permanently bound to a governmental group. So I never wanted to go that high, because then you're in for life. <laughs> that would suck. But, yeah, they got out there pretty quick, because we were only about – I think we're only about 20 miles from one of our actual Ford base areas. So they got out there really quick and sat down. And yeah, they, just, they pulled a lot of us aside and 
they saw what was going on. They asked us questions, and then they said, we got it. And they all loaded out, and two more copters came in, and there was uh, three Gamma 1 teams total. And, yeah, they got, got their gear, went out there, and started shooting the shit out of them. And we stayed, excuse the language, but we stayed back at the Connex area, and a lot of us stayed up top on the Connexes. And we had a couple of technicals, so we put the Mauduces on the back of the technicals, aimed out to the areas we were worried about. And, not much happened after that, and we provided support. Anything got by and came our way, we'd plunk it. And after a while, um, they say, you know, everything had calmed down, and we had got back to some basic work, it was what we could do inside the area. And so I grabbed some uh, rack really quick and slept, and by morning, the EH team was back, and they were clearing stuff out, and they actually gave us restriction zones that we weren't to go out to, and... Uh, stuff like that. And it was like, all right, um, can I get a blood sample of one of those things? And the guy's like, yeah, go ahead. And he laughed. And I was like, huh, okay. A little side note, during the night, the individual that had initially gotten bit, who's named Kasai, he actually developed an anaphylactic reaction. Uh, really strange. The allergic reaction. Pretty he extreme. To the it, bite? Or was he bit? Yeah, around him. Okay. No, oh, no, he was, his whole uh, forearm was just torn to shreds. Wow. And it was swelling up pretty bad. And apparently he started developing anaphylaxis about half an hour after that. But, you know, they hit him with Epi and a couple other things and stabilized him pretty quick. And they got him out on one of the helicopters. So, you know, he actually did fine. But that was really weird. So I was a little bit nervous. And so we just took on contact handling. Uh, so basically, don't touch it. Right. And. You know, so, so this, I didn't manage to. Oh, go ahead. So when you approached the the scene, uh, the creature was already. Now, what what did you call it again? I'm sorry. Well, I found out one of the age guys called it whip dogs. Whip dogs. And, uh, okay. Yeah, named after their tail. Okay. And one of the indigenous, uh, one other guy claimed because I didn't understand what he was speaking, unfortunately, but. One guy claimed he was talking scorpion dogs, but there was no sting on the tail or anything. And, right. Um, but they reminded me a lot of Rhodesian Ridgebacks when they run. They didn't look like them, but Rhodesians and pit bulls have that super strong tail, which they can actually yeah. jack their direction of travel in almost instantaneously. Yeah, yeah. Even when they're just, you know, wagging their tail, a pit wagging oh, its God, tail yeah. and it hits you in the shin, you're just like, ow. Um. So when this thing is on the ground, is it making any noise? Was was there like what was the vocalization of the one on the ground, and I guess the vocalization of the ones that were surrounding you? The best way I can describe this, if you take all the fox craziness that fox noises make and mm -hmm. tone it down and give it more rasp, is very fox like, but deeper and raspier. And they did seem to. I, I can't say this for sure. Maybe I'm anthropomorphizing again, but it did seem like they had a call response, at least knowledge or language. I, I don't want to call it a language, but they had right. a call response system. Uh, you know, like wolves got a call response system, coyotes and all that. But yeah. yeah, they definitely seemed to demonstrate a call response system, but it wasn't anything I was familiar with, but it had the pattern and they did seem to be signaling each other to a limited extent. And during the nighttime, we did notice a lot of eye glow. It was pretty creepy. Now, was and, that through uh, your night vision or just just standing out in the dark looking like they were? Just standing out in the dark looking, but we had actually, we weren't going night vision too much. We actually have heavy halogens in the area, and okay. we just lit the area up like a you know, football field at night. Hmm. And so MVG is not very good at that point. <laughs> now, the, um, you know, the, I'm sorry, what were you going to say? I was going to say FLIR still worked, forward-looking infrared, but... Um, they were actually seeable on forward-looking infrared, you know, like predator vision. Right. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. So, go now, ahead. so the, the creature that was dead, um, the one that you – did you get the blood sample from that one or the one that the team – or the ones that the team had – Well, I couldn't rig anything for a blood sample, so I got okay. a tissue sample and put it in one of the shielded containers for rare earth, you know, rare earth vial mm -hmm. because they're mildly radioactive. So I figured that would hold it pretty well. And I uh, – Got that. And I was surprised the guy let me do it. I mean, it's not like there was any big, an EH team. Well, they deal with anything from predatory lions, hyena packs to like 
back up for insurgent attacks and they deal with high radio uh, radioactive emission areas because sometimes we run across those and they'll plot them all out so nobody gets into a bad area and, you know they're kind of jack of all trades and they're even more specialized than we are but they're still a monster on the ground right and uh so the uh, but, the mouth of this thing, what was that? Was it like a, a like a hyena, like a pit bull, like uh... you know? Really, the closest thing is like a combination of jackal and coyote is the best way I can describe it. So narrow, it didn't look, think? yeah, it's very narrow okay. and had a lot of power. Um, I mean, I bet its jaw power was on par with that of a very large wolf, and but. And they're pretty, I mean, they're pretty tall, but they're rangy, but they're obviously pretty heavy. I have no idea of the weight, but I know they're about four foot at the shoulder, and they're about like five foot nose to butt, and tail's got another two feet on it. But uh, what's really weird is they didn't, they have micro fur. I mean, it was just like, you ever seen a dog that's like really old and just got a little bit of fur on it? Yeah. It's like that, and their skin wasn't like super dark black. It was like, uh, you know, the underside, under, if you take the fur off some animals and you, they're black, you know, that kind of like dull grayish black that reflects light a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, it was like that. Hmm. And so what was really interesting is uh, when one of the guys, EH, just came back before I went to bed, he actually was like looking over that thing, and I was over there with a couple other guys, and he's like, Hey, you want to see something screwed up? And we're like, yeah. And he pulls the eyelids back, and there's a small rim along the upper lid inside of the eye, which barely comes out, and a couple more spots going across the top that were glowing red. And I was like, what the hell? And he explained to us that those were inward-facing photophores, and that's the first time I learned about that. Wow. And, uh, yeah, really cool. It's like a dying firefly light except red. Does, yeah. does that make any sense? Yeah, that's interesting. Um... Yeah, except <laughs> it wasn't making the eyes light up, but that was really – it was dead. But right. there's still biological reaction in a photophore for days afterwards. So, all right, so go ahead. No, no, that's just crazy. It's really cool to uh, – you... Very strange. So these guys have uh, obviously dealt with these things prior. Uh, yeah, EH teams are environmental hazards, and even if for insurance purposes, other than normal encounters, be they unexplainable, monstrous, or otherwise, are technically classified as environmental hazards under our insurance bond. Hmm. So if they're under our insurance bond, they're in known quantity. Uh, the EH team knew exactly what they were dealing with, or at least felt confident. And they didn't get hurt at all. And they did cleaned up the whole area. Right. Apparently what it attracted them, uh, they think, or that I at least got out of one of, one of the EH guys, was that uh, there had been a large poaching drop in that area, probably about three miles out. And a lot of people had poached out a lot of stuff or they'd taken a lot of animals and taken what they need from them and took what they wanted back and left a big carrion pile there. And they said, carrion piles, what's attracted them, but they wouldn't go into any more detail. Right. And I was like, that's interesting. So, so they kind of came um, like sharks do to the scent of blood and then just kind of spread out a little bit. Yeah. And I talked to a couple of indigenous and they just called them, uh, it translates to whip dogs or, um, it, it's, they're just another one of the Jin with another name, you know, Jin spirit, yeah. something or other. Dogs. That was going to be my next question is what, what, if anything, did the indigenous, if you were able to speak to them, said about the thing and if they were like, uh, cave dwelling or, I mean, it's obvious you're kind of in the desert a little bit, so it's, Oh, yeah, we're in the northwest of Sudan. If you look on that on a map, it's uh, your topo map's toilet paper once you get out of that area. It just doesn't matter. It's flat sand for <laughs> way long time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. There is an actual endorheic, or, or, sorry, no, uh, a closed drainage basin in that area, meaning like uh, the Great Salt Lake is a closed drainage basin is a good example. Nothing gets out underneath the sand and there's a lot of halide deposits or salt deposits and different sort of seabed stones in some of that area. And if the water is not there, then, you know, there was old water. So the limestone area and the halide deposits or salt deposits would have a whole bunch of caves in them just due to water from that because there's a endorheic basin 
probably like about eight miles from there. Right. So, and then, then one of the locals <clears throat> actually said, one of the locals pointed at something interesting, and I'm surprised none of us thought of this. He's like, yes, that's where Anubis came from. And I'm like, what? And he says, the legends of Anubis came from those damn things. They oh, come wow. out of the sand. They kill. And I'm like, okay. I feel like I'm in a bad movie here. But yeah, he's, he's a good guy, but really yeah. old school. Yeah, I'm wondering if like, yeah, like, I mean, the way you're describing it, Anubis really doesn't look like he's that hairy. <laughs> You know, uh, and he does have kind of a jackalish looking face as well. That's yeah, none of these things had ears that popped up. It looked like mm. they were permanently laid down, but I never saw an ear up, but they're always down, even when they're dead. So, but yeah, that's how I ran across my first uh, <laughs> knowledge of photophores in the eyes. Yeah, that's and, crazy. Yeah, a can but... form. <laughs> I love that. I love the terms you're using. Now, um, this was the first time you saw it when the the local was attacked. Was it day, night? Was it? Oh dark yeah, out? it was about <clears throat> yeah, it was about an hour and a half, couple hours before sunset. Okay. Now the but ones I mean, that you the sh saw, the shadows are long. Right, the ones that you saw afterward, um, prior prior darkness before the team came. Um, were they running around or were they just standing? How were they? What was like their kind of reaction to everything? Well, I can only say where I was at. Um, initially it was like, cause, um, there's two people that had, uh, sh cause that one had been, the guy had been freed from the creature and one of the guys was just dragging him back really fast, like a sack of potatoes while the yeah. other two were training on him. And they shot it up pretty good. It was doing that whole seizure death thing. And then there's about four more out there directly. So we all sighted up on there and just took some shots and quite a few of them, you know, I'd probably say about half of them, to two of them went right down, but they still did that seizure-y kind of fighting stuff trying to get up thing. And But I mean, like they went down, probably only took like two to five bullets a shot. And, I mean, still, you know, it's unnerving, but yeah, yeah. this is actually probably about 10 years after my whole Canada incident. So I'm not like super freaked out. And I've seen a lot of other <clears throat> weird stuff, but right. I mean, like still, this is unpleasant. And we got other people around the Connex is starting to light up other areas. So we definitely have too many out here. And I never felt we were at super direct risk, but Unknown is really bad because I don't know the variables and no one does. Weird can get you killed quicker than uh, skilled forces. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. yeah, because you have no idea what to expect, you know. So it's just like a, it's a learning exercise at that point for you guys how to react and act. Yeah, these I mean, things. <clears throat> there's a lot of that uh, local <clears throat> shrub. We call it Moses bush because it puts out so many fumes during the summer that are ignitable you can actually like a, a rock sparking it or you throw a flare in there the whole place is just blows up that's how it propagates the seed so they're jumping in and out of the moses bush and going down in different areas and you know they're using cover but i mean i never felt they were like i never felt they were a tactical threat or a right. skilled threat they're obviously by myself in the desert i would not like my odds but uh we were well established so but it was uh still it was unpleasant and but we had a lot of support there in a very quick time and we had everything mitigated other than the guy having the uh uh anaphylaxis yeah uh, what there's happened? no other issue or did incident. you see him after he he left did he come back or i mean he came back about yeah, he came back pretty quick, but I don't remember exactly how long it took him back, but it was a lot shorter than I would have expected. Mm. Um, I mean, people in the desert don't bleed out. It's part of a genetic thing. You know, their bodies just water conservation-wise. They clot fast. Okay. So, and that, that's not a racist comment. That's just adaptation to the environment. It's right. Crude. No, I'm talking, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of like the anaphylactic shock thing and, and you know, what maybe it caused that. I wonder if it was like a, Kind of like, you know, the uh, kimono dragon has kind of a a bacteria in its mouth. Maybe that's what caused this because of the bacteria in its mouth. Yeah. I looked at its mouth and it was just like I said, kind of like a, you know, coyote jackalish kind of mouth. I didn't see anything abnormal other 
than what it is. Right. I mean, I didn't see any specialized injectors, no dissociated lower jaw for allowing this or that. I mean, but yeah, it could be a natural bacteria or something like that. I've never heard of that and anything. I mean, if anybody out there actually has a cryptid encounter that resulted in anaphylactic shock or dermatitis, give Jeff a message. I yeah. would love to talk to you. <laughs> well, that's very interesting. You know, you're it's kind of, it's kind of weird to think, you know, maybe it's one of their uh, tactics of hunting, bite quick or cause shock. And, you know, in case they get away, they will eventually find you. <laughs> oh, yeah, that guy was definitely in shock. I mean, like, it didn't seem to have much fear of people coming up on it. I talked to the guy who gunned it first, and he just saw like, the guy getting taken down, and he just, you know, you don't have much time to look at stuff. So you're just like, there's a creature on a person, take some careful shots. And, you know, that's what he did. And the rest of us came into the area. So it's interesting. I mean, the tissue sample just wasn't, I mean, I have equipment for looking at rocks and, you know, we have some very fine level, uh, you know, even that projects up to a television screen. So it makes it really easy to actually look at the ore bodies and look for, uh, you know, macro micro expression of the atomic structure. Uh, so, you know, we look for various things and ranges from 500 to 5,000 times viewing. And you have to be so careful because if you even, we have a tiny little worm gear system to move it around at 5,000 magnification because you try to move it by hand, it's just going to look like you cover 300 miles in one shot on the screen. Yeah. But, uh, tried appropriating that for that and I just treated it as, uh, hazmat and I really couldn't get much data it looked pretty there's nothing abnormal like the one up in canada it looked like it's a lot darker mm -hmm. though it looked like oxygen depleted blood okay. you know like uh you know arterial blood god forbid if you ever see it is some bright neon red stuff but uh our standard blood that we use out of our body when we get cut or you know bad cut you know it's that kind of darker oxygen depleted right the whole thing looked like that and yeah, and I wish I could have done a lot more with that, but when the team, you know, but that's, when the team cleaned it up, w w did they use any special, or did they just kind of clean them up? Did they didn't put them in any kind of containers or any kind of like plastic, whatever? They no, just... they tarped the hell. They, the one in the base, they just tarped the hell out of it and threw it in the chopper. And there's some uh, Chinooks and uh, a couple other bigger transports that were going out to the area where, and they landed. Uh, one of the smaller transports like the it right in the center but the other ones were going out there and going in and they're picking stuff up on the underside and so they were doing a bottom haul for a lot mm -hmm. of stuff that i could tell when one went by us but, right now i know you, you know, said just, you didn't know the weight but if you had to take a guess what would you say weight would be if you had to guess yeah. and i hate giving subjective measurements but I'd probably I know. say around, I, I know, I'd probably say around like, I mean, the lightest it could possibly be would be 150. And I think the heaviest it could be is around 300. Okay. But in a can of form, go hitting you that hard. That's, dude, that's pretty freaking scary. We yeah. Two guard dogs up here that are uh, well trained and they're 155 pounds, well, 153 and 155. They're brothers out of a litter and yeah they're very fearsome <laughs> so uh, if you kind of think of that and these things were bigger than that but once again i don't know muscle density or skin or total right. bone weight no i mean i had but, a Nikita that was 110 pounds and she was a monster and yeah and she just you know that she didn't look like 110 pounds well kind of not really but did but 350 pounds for you know anything is is Large, especially living in the desert too. I mean, that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of food to to consume to get to be that big. Yeah, and if this falls into the weirder cryptid family, yeah, I don't think yeah. their food and our food might be the same. But, yeah, no. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just uh, you know, it's uh, paws weren't abnormal. Uh, it, the paws were just giant caniform that um. You know, and there was a digigrade, uh, so it was definitely never went up on its back legs, you know, because the heel was elevated where a dog's would be with the tarsal bones extending down to the toe. So it's walking just like a dog. But the fact that they can turn so quickly and they really didn't seem to have that much muscle on the leg. I mean, like, 
their legs were about as thick of as thick as a starving person's arm over there. Mm-hmm. I mean, but obviously very strong, and they'd have to have a huge amount of tensile strength. The haunches were way over muscled. You know, uh, from the elbow and knee up were actually really thickly muscled, but the lower limbs almost look like they'd snap off, but <laughs> obviously they're well designed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I thought the paws would be bigger per ratio for dealing with sand, but they didn't look like sand paw construction. I mean, or snowshoe hair or any of that. Right. That's very strange. Just the, the whole, like the, it is a cryptid. That's the thing is it is a cryptid. You know, it's, it's an unknown, an unknown animal in a location that doesn't have that animal living there. Um, I like the, the way the man said, that's where Anubis came from. They come out of the sand and, and like you had said with the uh, mines, you know, maybe they're just coming out of the mines and people, the indigenous people are thinking, Hey, these things are coming out of the sand, but yeah, they're coming out of the mines. Uh, the sand could blow over the, you know, the wadis and the playas, you know, yeah. dried and wet lakes. And there's a lot of wadis out there, which are a little, uh, kind of like an oasis, uh, down in the escarpments between it before you get out in the main desert. So, um, and then, you know, so that's the first time I saw photo force. I like that guy. He's like, you guys want to see something neat? <laughs> like, oh, okay. He didn't have a hick accent, but you know, he's still actually pretty funny. Um, but yeah, it's like, so that's where I first became aware of photo force and, they obviously knew about them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's pretty amazing. I mean, I wonder how yeah. many times they had to deal with these things prior to. And uh, they seem it... to be very good at dealing with them, or at least dealing with. There's a lot of stuff in Africa that's not reported. I mean, like if they had first world luxuries like we do over here and time on our hands, I'm sure there would be channels that would put ours to shame. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you and I have talked about a couple of non-cryptid events over there that were pretty crazy. But uh, In that yeah, location, I mean, what are the largest, minus these whip dogs, uh, what are the largest predator in that location that you were at? Um, for that one time, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not yeah. saying all the time that you were over there. but Well, know. there's African dogs in that area. Which, and I mean, like, they, they're they and they're spelled D-H-O-L-E. It's yeah. just a type of African dog. And, you know, there's some out in that area, even though they're, quote, sp- not supposed not to be. But they've been following the main road from Khartoum to El Fizer across Sudan and then branching out. So if they're civilization, you're going to get those dogs in the background. But, uh, they're not that yeah, those things though, are like... Nah, they're like 10, 20% of the size of these things at yeah. the most. And everything else is pretty small out there. Yeah. I mean, a weird, scary thing about the desert out there that people don't realize is that we poop and pee in buckets with uh, cat litter and the, that weird uh, gel that looks like hard pellets and expands into gel. Because if you pee on the ground out there, you'll be surprised at how many things crawl out of the sand, bugs and mosquitoes come out of nowhere. And if you poop on the sand, you're going to have like more life than you ever thought was possible for a desert to have going for that one piece of poop. Wow. So we actually have a very closed system with that mm-hmm. because it's almost like a zombie movie. You leave a poop or water or pee on the ground and stuff just starts popping out of the desert that you didn't think was around. You're just like, Oh, <laughs> bad way to attract nasty things. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Not good. Imagine. I don't know. I just got bad dreams taking a poop in the desert and falling down or something. <laughs> not, um, not a good yeah, time. It, yeah, it's a little bit weird coming back to civilization. You forget there's a toilet and you don't want to pee. So it was, where's Mark? And you're like, ah, <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in real world now. I, I got to find a bathroom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So these things, so, I don't mean to keep, uh, no, go, but go. these things are like, I'm, I'm just, because I've never heard of it. I've, I've always known that there were, and, and you and I have had conversations outside of what we've recorded. And we've talked about, oh, yeah. we've talked about portal. We've talked about uh, different things that cryptids could, could evolve from or come from. And uh, I, I've been thinking a lot about portals for certain ones, for certain cryptids that really, we don't hear about or that don't fit the norm and these things are very large for that area they it's almost like a, like you explained desert animals aren't big because for the simple fact that you're in a desert 
Yeah. Um, and how their paws were not meant for running on sand, but they were very adapted to running on sand or, you know, like in front of you, they weren't having a hard time running. Um, yeah, we are a combination like, of uh, hard pack and sand, you know, kind of like, uh, I don't know, the edge of the sand dunes out there in Colorado. You kind of got that mix of the desert and the sand, so it's right. more like that. So I'm wondering maybe if there is a portal out in there somewhere, you know, it could be, it could be maybe these things are coming from there. Who knows? And, uh, yeah, and we talked cool. about it could be bosonic <laughs> matter actually converting to fermionic matter, which is actually would doable and, you yeah. know, we've talked about the science behind that and to me that'd make a lot more sense uh, but yeah that's a whole different subject and i have no idea how to talk about that one in a way that would be palatable but uh maybe that's something in the future we can talk about <laughs> definitely maybe um but wow but that's... i'll bring portals before aliens and i know a lot of people think i'm crazy but you know <laughs> it just makes no sense to me well i don't know i've thought about it and i i I'm kind of, I'm on board, but now that the more I talk about this Dulce thing, I'm kind of more on board uh, with the uh, portals and and outer space, but maybe there's a portal that leads to outer space. Who knows? Yeah. You know, so. But I agree with you. I, I listen to your Dulce stuff, actually. I'd never heard of that stuff before. Um, so apparently that's really well known. I, it's kind of funny. I knew the uh, son of one of the people who worked on Gas Buggy. He was actually a contractor over there. He's based out of Cartoon. Uh, but he never talked about any of that. But um, that was kind of interesting to hear that. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting stuff. It's uh, it's strange. I mean, his, like when I was his dad died nights. of like 12 types of cancer. Oh, sorry. His oh, dad who, died of like 12 types of cancer. So that that's mean? why. I'm, uh, actually, I don't think he'd appreciate that. But okay. his, uh, his father was worked on gas buggy as a technician and stuff like that, where they're doing a lot of geological assay and clearing. So he wasn't like super rank or anything, but right. yeah, he died of like 12 types of cancer. And his son really liked the work and had government connections and got to be a Gamma 2. And he wanted the Gamma 1, I think. So anyway, cool. sorry, I didn't interrupt. Go no, ahead. no, you didn't. That was, I just, it, strange that I was, when I was, doing tonight's upload and uh something popped into my head with the how the people were being labeled as uh missing or you know unexplained death or whatever and i was like huh it's just you know it falls into what we're going through right now you know in modern time i mean it was only 50 years ago but you know maybe uh Maybe the government and whatever has uh, the government made packs with are back at what they've been, what they were doing back then. <laughs> Could be. I mean, I've got a personal prediction that, you know, we've gone through the Bigfoot phase and we're in the middle of the Dogman phase. Um, I think pretty soon in the next five to 10 years, it's going to be predominantly pull offs or whatever they decide to call them at that time is going to kind of come into the new eyeball and wavelength of everybody talking about it but that's just how i feel yeah. is going to happen with that and i think so. the pull-off fits into the i think the pull-off fits into the kind of reptilian and i know you hate the word but alien and i only use alien as like not from outer oh, yeah. space, oh, but fine. alien to what we are used to um yeah you know then that that really it, it, they're fascinating too because we know nothing about them. So. And I've listened to a lot of your stuff in a couple other places, and it really does seem like the caniforms are demonstrating a lot of the pull-offs abilities, too. The uh, Vanderwall forces to go up and down and the ability to camouflage out, probably using the same chromatophore photophore system. Said It's just almost like there's a spectrum of manifestation or existence in cryptids, um, you know, just ranging from you know, like a dial across the way. And they just seem to be every point of the dial seems to be a manifestation sharing different traits. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah. It's, <laughs> I, I can honestly say there is not a day that I am not uh, shocked or not, not fascinated, I guess is the thing. I'm just always kind of something, I get a subscriber email and it just, 
you know, hey, this might not be interesting to you, but then I'm like, holy, how are they thinking this is not interesting? You know, like, it's a very strange, strange world we live in. And uh, you got to appreciate it, though. Yeah, I mean, I like sharing the information because I, it's not whether people believe it or not. It's more of if you hear what I'm talking about and there's some minor explanations for you, it might help you put together something that no one has thought about or at least further a whole bunch of knowledge or at least take the <clears throat> mystery and terror out of everything. But, I mean, I think it's – I hope people utilize the knowledge for their own application, um, so not just entertainment. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely true. Well, it was yeah. awesome having you on um, and sharing the, the yeah. whip dog. I really enjoyed that. And my, I think I'm going to think about that and kind of look at some encounters differently now when it comes to just uh, quadruped canine like creatures and kind of compare, hey, maybe this is, you know, uh, something. I kind of want. Oh, yeah, to, I see. Oh, sorry. No, I'm sorry. I, I kind of want to just go, and uh, I wish that there was a way of locating some. You know, like you said, if they, if Africa had the modern technology we have, the encounters coming out of there would be insane. Um. Yeah, they would be. Um, actually, I. I still have quite a few friends that I keep in contact with over there. That might be something interesting for the two of us to explore. Yeah, definitely. definitely. See if I can get any of their encounters and gigs and overall. But yeah, well, thanks everybody for showing up for the show. And I hope you guys do well, stay well, and hope you're nice to each other and you find cool stuff to learn. And if you find cool stuff to learn, let Jeff know. And share it, please, yes. Steph, it's always a pleasure. Don't hang up. I want to talk to you after. And uh, thank you sure for thing. sharing your experiences with us. Right on. Everyone take care. Bye-bye. All right, folks. I hope you all enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. Uh, last night in the live, a subscriber asked about Steph and how he's doing and when he's going to come back. Uh, for the new people, Steph uh, has been battling cancer for a while now. Um, but he is, uh, working very hard to put the, his cancer in remission. Um, last I talked to him, he was in the hospital, but then he, he did end up getting out. Uh, he's still under a lot of you know, he's still got a lot of recovery to, to do before, before I'd even want him to come back, uh, and talk, you know, um, even with him sitting in a chair at his home, relaxing, it's still a lot to just share, you know, it takes a lot out of a person when they're sharing experiences and sharing information. So, I'd much rather have him be at, you know, a hundred percent, 90%, heck even 85% at, because then he would be mentally and physically strong enough to come on and share the interesting stuff he has seen. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. Your support is what makes the channel continue to grow and go and what makes this channel special is you and i appreciate it guys please stay safe happy healthy and ever vigilant keeping an eye on our children our pets our family and friends these creatures are real they are out there they are dangerous share this information with the people you love and care about and it may just help save their lives someday and until next time never stop searching for answers never stop asking questions and god bless